Chapter Twelve of the Border Legion by Zane Gray. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Those bitter words of Cleves, as if he mocked himself, were the last Joan heard, and they rang in her ears and seemed to reverberate through her dazed mind like a knell of doom. She lay there, all blackness about her, weighed upon by an insupportable burden and she prayed that day might never dawn for her. A nightmare of oblivion ended at last, with her eyes opening to the morning light. She was cold and stiff. She had lain uncovered all the long hours of night. She had not moved a finger since she had fallen upon the bed, crushed by those bitter words with which Cleve had consented to join Kells's legion. Since then Joan felt that she had lived years, she could not remember a single thought she might have had during those black hours. Nevertheless, a decision had been formed in her mind, and it was that today she would reveal herself to Jim Cleve if it cost both their lives. Death was infinitely better than the suspense and fear and agony she had endured. And as for Jim, it would at least save him from crime. Joan got up, a little dizzy and unsteady upon her feet. Her hands appeared clumsy and shaky. All the blood in her seemed to surge from heart to brain, and it hurt her to breathe. Removing her mask, she bathed her face and combed her hair. At first she conceived an idea to go out without her face covered. But she thought better of it. Cleve's reckless defiance had communicated itself to her. She could not now be stopped. Kells was gay and excited that morning. He paid her compliments. He said they would soon be out of this lonely gulch, and she would see the sight of her life, a gold strike. She would see men wager a fortune on the turn of a card, lose, laugh, and go back to the digging. He said he would take her to Sacramento and Frisco and buy her everything a girl could desire. He was wild, voluble, unreasoning obsessed by the anticipated fulfillment of his dream. It was rather late in the morning, and there were a dozen or more men in and around the cabin, all as excited as Kells. Preparations were already under way for the expected journey to the gold field. Packs were being laid out, overhauled and repacked. Saddles and bridles and weapons were being worked over. Clothes were being awkwardly mended. Horses were being shod and the job was as hard and disagreeable for men as for horses. Whenever a rider swung up the slope, and one came every now and then, all the robbers would leave off their tasks and start eagerly for the newcomer. The name Jesse Smith was on everybody's lips. Any hour he might be expected to arrive and corroborate Blicky's alluring tale. Joan saw, or imagined she saw, that the glances in the eyes of these men were yellow, like gold fire. She had seen miners and prospectors, whose eyes shone with a strange glory of light that gold inspired, but never as those of Kells's bandit legion. Presently Joan discovered that, despite the excitement, her effect upon them was more marked than ever, and by a difference that she was quick to feel. But she could not tell what this difference was how their attitude had changed. Then she set herself the task of being useful. First she helped Bate Wood. He was roughly kind. She had not realized that there was sadness about her until he whispered, Don't be downcast, miss. Maybe it'll come out right yet. That amazed Joan. Then his mysterious winks and glances, the sympathy she felt in him, all attested to some kind of a change. She grew keen to learn, but she did not know how. She felt the change in all the men. Then she went to Pierce, and with all a woman's craft, she exaggerated the silent sadness that had brought quick response from Wood. Red Pierce was even quicker. He did not seem to regard her proximity as that of a feminine thing which roused the devil in him. Pierce could not be other than coarse and vulgar but there was pity in him. Joan sensed pity and some other quality still beyond her. 
this lieutenant of the bandit Kells was just as mysterious as Wood. Joan mended a great jagged rent in his buckskin shirt. Pierce appeared proud of her work. He tried to joke. He said amiable things. Then, as she finished, he glanced furtively around. He pressed her hand. I had a sister once, he whispered. And then, with a dark and baleful hate, Kells, he'll get his over in the gold camp. Joan turned away from Pierce, still more amazed. Some strange, deep undercurrent was working here. There had been unmistakable hate for Kells in his dark look and a fierce implication in his portent of fatality. What had caused this sudden impersonal interest in her situation? What was the meaning of the subtle animosity toward the bandit leader? Was there no honor among evil men banded together for evil deeds? Were jealousy, ferocity, hate, and faithlessness fostered by this wild and evil border life, ready at an instant's notice to break out? Joan divined the vain and futile and tragical nature of Kell's great enterprise. It could not succeed. It might bring a few days or weeks of fame, of blood-stained gold, of riotous gambling, but by its very nature it was doomed. It embraced failure and death. Joan went from man to man, keener now, on the track of this inexplicable change, sweetly and sadly friendly to each, and it was not till she encountered the little Frenchman that the secret was revealed. Frenchy was of a different race. Deep in the fiber of his being inculcated a sentiment, a feeling long submerged in the darkness of a wicked life. And now that something came fleeting out of the depths, and it was respect for a woman. To Joan it was a flash of light. Yesterday these ruffians despised her. Today they respected her. So they had believed what she had so desperately flung at Jim Cleve. They believed her good. They pitied her. They respected her. They responded to her effort to turn a boy back from a bad career. They were bandits, desperados, murderers lost. But each remembered in her a mother or a sister. What each might have felt or done had he possessed her, as Kells possessed her, did not alter the case as it stood. A strange inconsistency of character made them hate Kells for what they might not have hated in themselves. Her appeal to Cleve, her outburst of truth, her youth and misfortune, had discovered to each a human quality. As in Kells, something of nobility still lingered, ghost among his ruined ideals. So in the others some goodness remained. Joan sustained an uplifting divination. No man was utterly bad. Then came the hideous image of the giant Golden, the utter absence of soul in him, and she shuddered. Then came the thought of Jim Cleve, who had not believed her, who had bitterly made the fatal step, who might in the strange reversion of his character be beyond influence. And it was at this precise moment when this thought rose to counteract the hope revived by the changed attitude of the men that Joan looked out to see Jim Cleve sauntering up, careless, untidy, a cigarette between his lips, blue blotches on his white face, upon him the stamp of abandonment. Joan suffered a contraction of heart that benumbed her breast. She stood a moment battling with herself. She was brave enough, desperate enough, to walk straight up to Cleve, remove her mask, and say, I'm Joan. But that must be a last resource. She had no plan, yet she might force an opportunity to see Cleve alone. A shout rose above the hubbub of voices. A tall man was pointing across the gulch, where dust clouds showed above the willows. Men crowded round him, all gazing in the direction of his hand, all talking at once. "'Jess Smith's horse, I swear!' shouted the tall man. "'Kells, come out here!' Kells appeared, dark and eager, at the door, and nimbly he leaped to the excited group. Pearson and Wood and others followed. "'What's up?' called the bandit. "'Hello. Who's that riding bareback?' 
He's sure cutting the wind, said Wood. Blicky, exclaimed the tall man. Kells, there's news. I seen Jess's horse. Kells let out a strange, exultant cry. The excited talk among the men gave place to a subdued murmur, then subsided. Blicky was running a horse up the road, hanging low over him like an Indian. He clattered to the bench, scattered the men in all directions. The fiery horse plunged and pounded. Blicky was gray of face and wild of aspect. Jesse's come, he yelled hoarsely at Kells. He just fell off his horse, all in. He wants you and all the gang. He's seen a million dollars in gold dust. Absolute silence ensued after that last swift and startling speech. It broke to a commingling of yells and shouts. Blicky wheeled his horse, and Kells started on a run, and there was a stampede and rush after him. Joan grasped her opportunity. She had seen all this excitement, but she had not lost sight of Cleve. He got up from a log and started after the others. Joan flew to him, grasped him, startled him with the suddenness of her onslaught. But her tongue seemed cloven to the roof of her mouth, her lips weak and mute. Twice she strove to speak. Meet me, there, among the pines, right away, she whispered, with breathless earnestness. It's life or death for me. As she released his arm, he snatched at her mask, but she eluded him. Who are you? he flashed. Kells and his men were piling into the willows, leaping the brook, hurrying on. They had no thought but to get to Jesse Smith to hear of the gold strike. That news to them was as finding gold in the earth was to honest miners. Come, cried Joan. She hurried away to the corner of the cabin, then halted to see if he was following. He was indeed. She ran round behind the cabin, out on the slope, halting at the first trees. Cleve came striding after her. She ran on, beginning to pant and stumble. The way he strode, the white grimness of him frightened her. What would he do? Again she went on, but not running now. There were straggling pines and spruces that soon hid the cabins. Beyond a few rods was a dense clump of pines, and she made for that. As she reached it, she turned fearfully. Only Cleve was in sight. She uttered a sob of mingled relief, joy, and thankfulness. She and Cleve had not been observed. They would be out of sight in this little pine grove. At last she could reveal herself, tell him why she was there, that she loved him, that she was as good as ever she had been. Why was she shaking like a leaf in the wind? She saw Cleve through a blur. He was almost running now. Involuntarily, she fled into the grove. It was dark and cool. It smelled sweetly of pine. There were narrow aisles and little sunlit glades. She hurried on till the fallen tree blocked her passage. Here she turned. She would wait. The tree was good to lean against. There came Cleve, a dark, stalking shadow. She did not remember him like that. He entered the glade. Speak again, he said thickly. Either I'm drunk or crazy. But Joan could not speak. She held out her hands that shook, swept them to her face, tore at the mask. Then, with a gasp, she stood revealed. If she had stabbed him straight through the heart, he could not have been more ghastly. Joan saw him in all the terrible transfiguration that came over him. But she had no conceptions, no thought, of what constituted that change. After that check to her mind came a surge of joy. Jim, Jim, it's Joan, she breathed, with lips almost mute. Joan, he gasped, and the sound of his voice seemed to be the passing from horrible doubt to certainty. Like a panther, he leaped at her, fastened a powerful hand at the neck of her blouse, jerked her to her knees, and began to drag her. Joan fought his iron grasp. The twisting and tightening of her blouse choked her utterance. He did not look down upon her, 
but she could see him, the rigidity of his body set in violence, the awful shade upon his face, the upstanding hair on his head. He dragged her as if she had been an empty sack. Like a beast, he was seeking a dark place, a hole to hide her. She was strangling, a distorted sight made objects dim. And now she struggled instinctively. Suddenly the clutch at her neck loosened. Gaspingly came the intake of air to her lungs. The dark red veil left her eyes. She was still upon her knees. Cleve stood before her like a gray-faced demon, holding his gun level, ready to fire. Pray for your soul and mine. Jim, oh, Jim, will you kill yourself too? Yes, but pray, girl, quick. Then I pray to God, not for my soul, but just for one more moment of life. To tell you, Jim. Cleve's face worked, and the gun began to waver. Her reply had been a stroke of lightning in the dark abyss of his jealous agony. Joan saw it, and she raised her quivering face, and she held up her arms to him. To tell you, Jim, she entreated. What, he rasped out, that I'm innocent, that I'm as good a girl as ever, ever. Let me tell you, oh, you're mistaken, terribly mistaken. Now I know I'm drunk, you, Joan Randall, you in that rig, you the companion of Jack Kells, not even his wife, the jest of these foul-mouthed bandits, and you say you're innocent, good, when you refuse to leave him? I was afraid to go. Afraid you'd be killed, she moaned, beating her breast. It must have seemed madness to him, a monstrous nightmare, a delirium of drink, that Joan Randall was there on her knees in a brazen male attire, lifting her arms to him, beseeching him not to spare her life, but to believe in her innocence. Joan burst into swift, broken utterance. Only listen, I trailed you out, twenty miles from Hoadley. I met Roberts. He came with me. He lamed his horse. We had the camp. Kells rode down on us. He had two men. They camped there. Next morning, he killed Roberts, made off with me. Then he killed his men, just to have me alone to himself. We crossed a range, camped in the canyon. There he attacked me, and I, I shot him. But I couldn't leave him to die. Joan hurried on with her narrative, gaining strength and eloquence as she saw the weakening of Cleve. First he said I was his wife to fool that Golden, and the others, she went on. He meant to save me from them. But they guessed or found out. Kells forced me into these bandit clothes. He's depraved somehow, and I had to wear something. Kells hasn't harmed me. No one has. I have influence over him. He can't resist it. He tried to force me to marry him, and he's tried to give up to his evil intentions, but he can't. There's good in him. I can make him feel it. Oh, he loves me, and I'm not afraid of him any more. It has been a terrible time for me, Jim, but I'm still the same girl you knew you used to. Cleve dropped the gun, and he waved his hand before his eyes as if to dispel a blindness. But why, why, he asked incredulously, why did you leave Hodley? That's forbidden. You knew the risk. Joan gazed steadily up at him, to see the whiteness slowly fade out of his face. She had imagined it would be an overcoming of pride to betray her love, but she had been wrong. The moment was so full, so overpowering, that she seemed dumb. He had ruined himself for her and out of that ruin had come the glory of her love. Perhaps it was all too late, but at least he would know that for love of him she had in turn sacrificed herself. Jim, she whispered, and with the first word of that betrayal, a thrill, a tremble, a rush went over her, and all her blood seemed hot at her neck and face. That night when you kissed me I was furious, but the moment you had gone I repented. I must have cared for you then, but I didn't know. Remorse seized me, and I set out on your trail to save you from yourself. And with the pain and fear and terror 
there was sometimes the sweetness of your kisses. Then I knew I cared. And with the added days of suspense and agony, all that told me of your throwing your life away, there came love. Such love as otherwise I'd never have been big enough for. I meant to find you, to save you, to send you home. I have found you, maybe too late to save your life, but not your soul, thank God. That's why I've been strong enough to hold back Kells. I love you, Jim. I love you. I couldn't tell you enough. My heart is bursting. Say you believe me. Say you know I'm good, true to you. You're Joan. And kiss me, like you did that night when we were such blind fools. A boy and a girl who didn't know, who couldn't tell. Oh, the sadness of it. Kiss me, Jim, before I drop at your feet. If only you believe. Joan was blinded by tears and whispering she knew not what when Cleve broke from his trance and caught her to his breast. She was fainting, hovering at the border of unconsciousness, when his violence held her back from oblivion. She seemed wrapped to him and held so tightly that there was no breath in her body, no motion, no stir of pulse. That vague, dreamy moment passed. She heard his husky, broken accents. She felt the pound of his heart against her breast. And he began to kiss her as she had begged him to. She quickened to thrilling, revivifying life. And she lifted her face and clung round his neck and kissed him, blindly, sweetly, passionately, with all her heart and soul in her lips, wanting only one thing in the world, to give that which she had denied him. Joan, 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 he murmured when their lips parted. Am I dreaming, drunk, or crazy? Oh, Jim, I'm real. You have me in your arms, she whispered. Dear Jim, kiss me again and say you believe me. Believe you? I'm out of my mind with joy. You loved me. You followed me. And that idea of mine, only an absurd, vile suspicion. I might have known had I been sane. There, oh, Jim, enough of madness. We've got the plan. Remember where we are. There's Kells and this terrible situation to meet. He stared at her, slowly realizing, and then it was his turn to shake. My God, I've forgotten. I'll have to kill you now. A reaction set in. If he had any self-control left, he lost it. And like a boy whose fling into manhood had exhausted his courage, he sank beside her and buried his face against her. And he cried in a low, tense, heartbroken way. For Joan, it was terrible to hear him. She held his hand to her breast and implored him not to weaken now. But he was stricken with remorse. He had run off like a coward. He had brought her to this calamity, and he could not rise under it. Joan realized that he had long labored under stress of morbid emotion. Only a supreme effort could lift him out of it to strong and reasoning equilibrium and that must come from her. She pushed him away from her and held him back, where he must see her, and white-hot with passionate purpose, she kissed him. Jim Cleve, if you're nerve enough to be bad, you're nerve enough to save the girl who loves you, who belongs to you. He raised his face, and it flashed from red to white. He caught the subtlety of her antithesis. With the very two words which had driven him away under the sting of cowardice, she uplifted him. And with all that was tender and faithful and passionate in her, meaning of surrender, she settled at once and forever the doubt of his manhood. He arose trembling in every limb. Like a dog he shook himself. His breast heaved. The shades of scorn and bitterness and abandon might never have haunted his face. In that moment he had passed from the reckless and wild, sick rage of a weakling to the stern, realizing courage of a man. His suffering on this wild border had developed a different fiber of character, and at the great moment, the climax, when his moral force hung balanced between elevation and destruction, the woman had called to him, and her unquenchable spirit passed into him. There's only one thing to get away, he said. 
Yes, but that's a terrible risk, she replied. We've a good chance now. I'll get horses. We can slip away while they're all excited. No, no, I daren't risk so much. Kells would find out at once. He'd be like a hound on our trail, but that's not all. I've a horror of Golden. I can't explain. I feel it. He would know. He would take the trail. I'd never try to escape with Golden in camp. Jim, do you know what he's done? He's a cannibal. I hate the sight of him. I tried to kill him. I wish I had killed him. I'm never safe while he's near. Then I will kill him. Hush. You'll not be desperate unless you have to be. Listen, I'm safe with Kells for the present. And he's friendly to you. Let us wait. I'll keep trying to influence him. I have won the friendship of some of his men. We'll stay with him, travel with him. Surely we have a better chance to escape after we reach that gold camp. You must play your part, but do it without drinking and fighting. I couldn't bear that. We'll see each other somehow. We'll plan. Then we'll take the first chance to get away. We might never have a better chance than we've got right now, he remonstrated. It may seem so to you, but I know. I haven't watched these ruffians for nothing. I tell you Golden has split with Kells because of me. I don't know how I know, and I think I'd die of terror out on the trail with two hundred miles to go and that gorilla after me. But, Joan, if once we got away, Golden would never take you alive, said Jim earnestly. So you needn't fear that. I've an uncanny horror of him. It's as if he were a gorilla, and would take me off even if I were dead. No, Jim, let us wait. Let me select a time I can do it. Trust me. Oh, Jim, now that I've saved you from being a bandit, I can do anything. I can fool Kells or Pierce or Wood, any of them, except Golden. If Kells had to choose now between trailing you and rushing for the gold camp, which would he do? He'd trail me, she said. But Kells is crazy over gold. He has two passions, to steal gold and to gamble with it. That may be, but he'd go after me first. So would Golden. We can't ride these hills as they do. We don't know the trails, the water. We'd get lost. We'd be caught. And somehow I know that Golden and his gang would find us first. You're probably right, Joan, replied Cleve. But you condemn me to a living death. To let you out of my sight with Kells or any of them, it'll be worse almost than my life was before. But, Jim, I'll be safe, she entreated. It's the better choice of two evils. Our lives depend on reason, waiting, planning. And, Jim, I want to live for you. My brave darling, to hear you say that, he exclaimed, with deep emotion, when I never expected to see you again. But the past is past. I begin over from this hour. I'll be what you want, do what you want. Joan seemed irresistibly drawn to him again, and the supplication, as she lifted her blushing face, and the yielding were perilously sweet. Jim, kiss me and hold me, the way you did that night. And it was not Joan who first broke that embrace. Find my mask, she said. Cleve picked up his gun, and presently the piece of black felt. He held it as if it were a deadly thing. Put it on me. He slipped the cord over her head and adjusted the mask so the holes came right for her eyes. Joan, it hides the, the goodness of you, he cried. No one can see your eyes now. No one will look at your face. That rig shows your... shows you off so. It's not decent. But, oh, Lord, I'm bound to confess how pretty, how devilish, how seductive you are. And I hate it. Jim, I hate it, too, but we must stand it. Try not to shame me any more. And now good-bye. Keep watch for me, as I will for you, all the time. Joan broke from him and glided out of the grove, away under the straggling pines along the slope. She came upon her horse, and she led him back to the corral. Many of the horses had strayed. There was no one at the cabin, but she saw men striding up the slope, Kells in the lead. She had been fortunate. Her absence could hardly have been noted. 
she had just strength left to get to her room, where she fell upon the bed, weak and trembling, and dizzy and unutterably grateful at her deliverance from the hateful, unbearable falsity of her situation. End of chapter 12《Chapter Thirteen of the Border Legion by Zane Grey. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. It was afternoon before Joan could trust herself sufficiently to go out again, and when she did, she saw that she attracted very little attention from the bandits. Kells had a springy step, a bright eye, a lifted head, and he seemed to be listening. Perhaps he was to the music of his sordid dreams. Joan watched him sometimes with wonder. Even a bandit plotting gold robberies with violence and blood merely means to an end, built castles in the air, and lived with joy. All that afternoon the bandits left camp in twos and threes, each party with pack burrows and horses, packed as Joan had not seen them before on the border. Shovels and picks and old sieves and pans, these swinging were tied in prominent places, were evidence that the bandits meant to assume the characters of miners and prospectors. They whistled and sang. It was a lark. The excitement had subsided and the action begun. Only in Kells, under his radiance, could be felt the dark and sinister plot. He was the heart of the machine. By sundown, Kells, Pierce, Wood, Jim Cleve, and a robust, grizzled bandit, Jesse Smith, were left in camp. Smith was lame from his ride, and Joan gathered that Kells would have left camp but for the fact that Smith needed rest. He and Kells were together all the time, talking endlessly. Joan heard them argue a disputed point. Would the men abide by Kells's plan? and go by twos and threes into the gold camp, and hide their relations as a larger band? Kells contended they would, and Smith had his doubts. "'Jack, wait till you see Alder Creek,' ejaculated Smith, wagging his grizzled head. Three thousand men, old and young, of all kinds, gone gold crazy. Alder Creek has got California, forty-nine and fifty-one, cinched to the last hole, and the bandit leader rubbed his palms in great glee. That evening they all had supper together in Kells's cabin. Batewood grumbled because he had packed most of his outfit. It so chanced that Joan sat directly opposite Jim Cleve, and while he ate he pressed her foot with his under the table. The touch thrilled Joan. Jim did not glance at her but there was such a change in him that she feared it might rouse Kells's curiosity. This night, however, the bandit could not have seen anything except the gleam of yellow. He talked, he sat at table, but did not eat. After supper he sent Joan to her cabin, saying they would be on the trail at daylight. Joan watched them a while from her covert. They had evidently talked themselves out, and Kells grew thoughtful. Smith and Pierce went outside, apparently, to roll their beds on the ground under the porch roof. Wood, who said he was never a good sleeper, smoked his pipe, and Jim Cleve spread blankets along the wall in the shadow and lay down. Joan could see his eyes shining toward the door. Of course he was thinking of her, but could he see her eyes? Watching her chance, she slipped a hand from behind the curtain, and she knew Cleve saw it. What a comfort that was! Joan's heart swelled. All might yet be well. Jim Cleve would be near her while she slept. She could sleep now without those dark dreams, without dreading to awaken to the light. Again she saw Kells pacing the room, silent, bent, absorbed, hands behind his back, waited with his burden. It was impossible not to feel sorry for him. With all his intelligence and cunning power, 
his cause was hopeless. Joan knew that, as she knew so many other things, without understanding why. She had not yet sounded Jesse Smith, but not a man of all the others was true to Kells. They would be of his border legion. Do his bidding, revel in their ill-gotten gains, and then, when he needed them most, be false to him. When Joan was awakened, her room was shrouded in gray gloom. A bustle sounded from the big cabin, and outside horses stamped and men talked. She sat alone at breakfast and ate by lantern light. It was necessary to take a lantern back to her cabin, and she was so long in her preparations there that Kells called again. Somehow she did not want to leave this cabin. It seemed protective and private, and she feared she might not find such quarters again. Besides, upon the moment of leaving, she discovered that she had grown attached to the place where she had suffered and thought and grown so much. Kells had put out the lights. Joan hurried through the cabin and outside. The gray obscurity had given way to dawn. The air was cold, sweet, bracing with a touch of mountain purity in it. The men except Kells were all mounted and the pack train was in motion. Kells dragged the rude door into position, and then mounting, he called to Joan to follow. She trotted her horse after him, down the slope, across the brook, and through the wet willows, and out upon the wide trail. She glanced ahead, discerning that the third man from her was Jim Cleve, and that fact, in the start for Alder Creek, made all the difference in the world. When they rode out of the narrow defile into the valley, the sun was rising red and bright in a notch of the mountains. Clouds hung over distant peaks, and patches of snow in the high canyons shone blue and pink. Smith in the lead turned westward up the valley. Horses trooped after the cavalcade and had to be driven back. There were also cattle in the valley. And all these Kells left behind like an honest rancher who had no fear for his stock. Deer stood off with long ears pointed forward, watching the horses go by. There were flocks of quail and whirring grouse and bounding jackrabbits and occasionally a brace of sneaking coyotes. These and the wildflowers and the waving meadow grass, the yellow-stemmed willows and the patches of alder were all pleasurable to Joan's eyes and restful to her mind. Smith soon led away from this valley, up out of the head of a ravine, across a rough rock-strewn ridge, down again into a hollow that grew to be a canyon. The trail was bad. Part of the time it was the bottom of a boulder-strewn brook, where the horses slipped on the wet, round stones. Progress was slow, and time passed. For Joan, however, it was a relief, and the slower they might travel, the better she would like it. At the end of that journey, there were Golden and the others, and the gold camp, with its illimitable possibilities for such men. At noon, the party halted for a rest. The campsite was pleasant, and the men were all agreeable. During the meal, Kells found occasion to remark to Cleve, Say, youngster, you've brightened up. Must be because of our prospects over here. Not that so much, replied Cleve. I quit the whiskey. To be honest, Kells, I was almost seeing snakes. I'm glad you quit. When you're drinking, you're wild. I never yet saw the man who could drink hard and keep his head. I can't, but I don't drink much. His last remark brought a response in laughter. Evidently his companions thought he was joking. He laughed himself and actually winked at Joan. It happened to be Cleve whom Kells told to saddle Joan's horse, and as Joan tried the cinches to see if they were too tight to suit her, Jim's hand came in contact with hers. The touch was like a message. Joan was thrilling all over as she looked at Jim, but he kept his face averted. Perhaps he did not trust his eyes. Travel was resumed up the canyon and continued steadily, though leisurely. 
but the trail was so rough and so winding that Joan believed the progress did not exceed three miles an hour. It was the kind of travel in which a horse could be helped, and that entailed attention to the lay of the ground. Before Joan realized the hours were flying, the afternoon had waned. Smith kept on, however, until nearly dark before halting for camp. The evening camp was a scene of activity, and all except Joan had work to do. She tried to lend a hand, but Wood told her the rest. This she was glad to do. When called to supper, she had almost fallen asleep. After a long day's ride, the business of eating precluded conversation. Later, however, the men began to talk between puffs on their pipes, and from the talk no one could have guessed that here was a band of robbers on their way to a gold camp. Jesse Smith had a sore foot, and he was compared to a tenderfoot on his first ride. Smith retaliated in kind. Every consideration was shown Joan, and Wood particularly appeared assiduous in his desire for her comfort. All the men except Cleve paid her some kind of attention, and he, of course, neglected her because he was afraid to go near her. Again she felt in Red Pierce a condemnation of the bandit leader, who was dragging a girl over hard trails, making her sleep in the open, exposing her to danger to men like himself and Golden. In his own estimate, Pierce, like every one of his kind, was not so slow as the others. Joan watched and listened from her blankets, under a leafy tree, some few yards from the campfire. Once Kells turned to see how far distant she was, and then lowering his voice, he told his story. The others laughed. Pierce followed with another, and he, too, took care that Joan could not hear. They grew closer for the mirth, and Smith, who evidently was a jolly fellow, set them to roaring. Jim Cleve laughed with them. "'Say, Jim, you're getting over it,' remarked Kells. "'Over what?' Kells paused, rather embarrassed for a reply, as evidently, in the humor of the hour, he had spoken a thought better left unsaid. But there was no more forbidding atmosphere about Cleve. He appeared to have rounded to good fellowship after a moody and quarrelsome drinking spell. "'Why, over what drove you out here, and gave me a lucky chance at you,' replied Kells, with a constrained laugh. "'Oh, you mean the girl? Sure, I'm getting over that, except when I drink.' "'Tell us, Jim,' said Kells, curiously. "'Ah, oh, you'll give me the laugh,' retorted Cleve. "'No, we won't, unless your story's funny.' "'You can gamble it wasn't funny,' put in Red Pierce. They all coaxed him, yet none of them, except Kells, was particularly curious. It was just that hour when men of their ilk were lazy and comfortable and full-fed and good-humored round the warm, blazing campfire. "'All right,' replied Cleve, and apparently, for all his complacence, a call upon memory had its pain. I'm from Montana, range rider in winter, and in summer I prospected. Saved quite a little money, in spite of a fling now and then at faro and whiskey. Yes, there was a girl, I guess yes. She was pretty. I had a bad case over her. Not long ago I left all I had, money and gold and things in her keeping, and I went prospecting again. We were to get married on my return. I stayed out six months, did well, and got robbed of all my dust. Cleve was telling this fabrication in a matter-of-fact way, growing a little less frank as he proceeded, and he paused while he lifted sand and let it drift through his fingers, watching it curiously. All the men were interested, and Kells hung at every word. When I got back, went on Cleve, my girl had married another fella. She'd given him all I left with her. Then I got drunk. While I was drunk, they put up a job on me. It was her word that disgraced me and run me out of town. So I struck west and drifted to the border. That's not all, said Kells bluntly. Jim, I reckon 
You ain't tellin' what you did to that lion girl and the fella. How'd you leave them? added Pierce. But Cleve appeared to be gloomy and reticent. Women can hand the double cross to a man. Hey, Kells, queried Smith with a broad grin. By gosh, I thought you'd been treated powerful mean, exclaimed Bate Wood, and he was full of wrath. A treacherous woman, exclaimed Kells passionately. He had taken Cleve's story hard. The man must have been betrayed by women, and Cleve's story had irritated old wounds. Directly Kells left the fire and repaired to his blankets, near where Joan lay. Probably he believed her asleep, for he neither looked nor spoke. Cleve sought his bed, and likewise Wood and Smith. Pierce was the last to leave, and as he stood up the light fell upon his red face, lean and bold like an Indian's. Then he passed Joan, looking down upon her, and then upon the recumbent figure of Kells, and if his glance was not baleful and malignant, as it swept over the bandit, Joan believed her imagination must be vividly weird, and running away with her judgment. The next morning began a day of toil. They had to climb over the mountain divide, a long, flat topped range of broken rocks. Joan spared her horse to the limit of her own endurance. If there were a trail, Smith alone knew it, for none was in evidence to the others. They climbed out of the notched head of the canyon, and up a long slope of weathered shale that let the horses slide back a foot for every yard gained, and through a labyrinth of broken cliffs and over bench and ridge to the height of the divide. From there Joan had a magnificent view. Foothills rolled, round heads below, and miles away, in a curve of the range, glistened Bear Lake. The rest here at this height was counteracted by the fact that the altitude affected Joan. She was glad to be on the move again, and now the travel was downhill, so that she could ride. Still it was difficult, for horses were more easily lamed in a descent. It took two hours to descend the distance that had consumed all the morning to ascend. Smith led through valley after valley, between foothills, and late in the afternoon halted by a spring in a timbered spot. Joan ached in every muscle, and she was too tired to care what happened round the campfire. Jim had been close to her all day, and that had kept up her spirit. It was not yet dark when she lay down for the night. "'Sleep well, Dandy Dale,' said Kells cheerfully, yet not without pathos. "'Alder Creek tomorrow. Then you'll never sleep again.' At times she seemed to feel that he regretted her presence, and always this fancy came to her with mocking or bantering suggestion that the costume and mask she wore made her a bandit's consort, and she could not escape the wildness in this gold-seeking life. The truth was that Kells saw the insuperable barrier between them, and in the bitterness of his love he lied to himself, and he hated himself for the lie. About the middle of the afternoon of the next day, the tired cavalcade rode down out of the brush and rock into a new, broad, dusty road. It was so new that the stems of the cut brush along the borders were still white but that road had been traveled by a multitude. Out across the valley in the rear, Joan saw a canvas-topped wagon, and she had not ridden far on the road when she saw a bobbing pack burrows to the fore. Kells had called Wood and Smith and Pierce and Cleve together, and now they went on in a bunch, all driving the pack train. Excitement again claimed Kells. Pierce was alert and hawk-eyed. Smith looked like a hound on a scent. Cleve showed genuine feeling. Only Bate Wood remained proof to the meaning of that broad road. All along on either side, Joan saw wrecks of wagons, wheels, harnesses, boxes, old rags of tents blown into the brush, dead mules and burrows. It seemed almost as if an army had passed that way. Presently the road crossed a wide, shallow brook of water, half clear and half muddy, 
and on the other side the road followed the course of the brook. Joan heard Smith call the stream Alder Creek, and he asked Kells if he knew what muddied water meant. The bandit's eyes flashed fire. Joan thrilled, for she too knew that upstream there were miners washing earth for gold. A couple of miles further on, Creek and Road entered the mouth of a wide, spruce-timbered gulch. These trees hid any view of the slopes or floors of the gulch, and it was not till several more miles had been passed that the bandit rode out into what Joan first thought was a hideous slash in the forest made by fire. But it was only the devastation wrought by men. As far as she could see, the timber was down, and everywhere began to be manifested signs that led her to expect habitations. No cabin showed, however, in the next mile. They passed out of the timbered part of the gulch into one of rugged, bare, and stony slopes, with bunches of sparse alder here and there. The gulch turned at right angles, and a gray slope shut out sight of what lay beyond. But once round that obstruction, Kells halted his men with short, tense exclamation. Joan saw that she stood high upon the slope looking down upon the gold camp. It was an interesting scene, but not too beautiful. To Kells it must have been so, but to Joan it was even more hideous than the slash in the forest. Here and there, everywhere, were rude dugouts, little huts of brush, an occasional tent, and an occasional log cabin. And as she looked farther and farther, these crude habitations of miners magnified in number and in dimensions, till the white and black, broken mass of the town choked the narrow gulch. "'Well, boss, what do you say to the diggings?' demanded Jesse Smith. Kells drew a deep breath. "'Old Forty-Niner, this beats all I ever saw.' "'Sure I've seen Sacramento look like that,' added Batewood. Pierce and Cleve gazed with fixed eyes, and however different their emotions— they rivaled each other in attention. "'Jesse, what's the word?' queried Kells, with a sharp return to the business of the matter. "'I've picked a site on the other side of camp. Best for us,' he replied. "'Shall we keep to the road?' "'Certainly,' he returned, with his grin. Kells hesitated and felt of his beard, probably conjecturing the possibility of recognition. "'Whiskers, make another man of you. Reckon you needn't expect to be known over here. That decided Kells. He pulled his sombrero well down, shadowing his face. Then he remembered Joan and made a slight significant gesture at her mask. Kells, the people in this here camp wouldn't look at an army riding through, responded Smith. It's every man for himself, and women say there's all kinds. I've seen a dozen with veils and them's the same as masks. Nevertheless, Kells had Joan remove the mask and pull her sombrero down, and instructed her to ride in the midst of the group. Then they trotted on, soon catching up with the jogging pack train. What a strange ride that was for Joan! The slope resembled a magnified ant hill, with a horde of frantic ants in action. As she drew closer, she saw these ants were men digging for gold. Those near at hand could be plainly seen, rough, ragged, bearded men and smooth-faced boys. Farther on and up the slope, along the waterways and ravines, were miners so close they seemed almost to interfere with one another. The creek bottom was alive with busy, silent, violent men, bending over the water, washing and shaking and paddling all desperately intent upon something. They had not time to look up. They were ragged, unkept, bare-armed, and bare-legged, every last one of them with bent back. For a mile or more, Kells's party trotted through this part of the diggings, and everywhere, on rocky bench and gravel bar and gray slope, were holes with men picking and shoveling in them. Some were deep and some were shallow some long trenches and other mere pits. 
in all of these prospectors were finding gold. Then gold was everywhere. And presently Joan did not need to have Kells tell her that all these diggers were finding dust. How silent they were, how tense. They were not mechanical. It was a soul that drove them. Joan had seen many men dig for gold and find a little now and then. But she had never seen men dig when they knew they were going to strike gold. That made the strange difference. Joan calculated that she must have seen a thousand miners in less than two miles of the gulch. And then she could not see up the draws and washes that intersected the slope. And she could not see beyond the camp. But it was not a camp which she was entering. It was a tent-walled town, a city of squat log cabins, a long, motley, checkered jumble of structures thrown up and together in mad haste. The wide road split it in the middle and seemed a stream of color and life. Joan rode between two lines of horses, burros, oxen, mules, packs, and loads, and canvas-domed wagons, and gaudy vehicles resembling gypsy caravans. The street was as busy as a beehive, and as noisy as a bedlam. The sidewalks were rough-hewn planks, and they rattled under the tread of booted men. There were tents on the ground, and tents on floors, and tents on log walls, and further on began the lines of cabin stores, and shops, and saloons and then a great square flat structure with a flaring sign in crude gold letters, Last Nugget, from which came the creak of idols and scrape of boots and hoarse mirth. Joan saw strange, wild-looking creatures, women that made her shrink, and several others of her sex, hurrying along, carrying sacks or buckets, worn and bewildered-looking women, the sight of whom gave her a pang. She saw lounging Indians and groups of lazy, bearded men, just like Kells's band, and gamblers in long black coats, and frontiersmen in fringed buckskin, and Mexicans with swarthy faces under wide peak sombreros. And then in great majority, dominating the stream of life, the lean and stalwart miners of all ages, in their check shirts and high boots, all packing guns, jostling along, dark-browed, somber, and intent. These last were the workers of this vast beehive. The others were the drones, the parasites. Kells's party rode on through the town, and Smith halted them beyond the outskirts, near a grove of spruce trees, where camp was to be made. Joan pondered over her impression of Alder Creek. It was confused. She had seen too much, but out of what she had seen and heard loomed two contrasting features, a throng of toiling miners, slaves to their lust for gold, and actuated by ambitions, hopes, and aims, honest, rugged, tireless workers, but frenzied in that strange pursuit, and a lesser crowd, like leeches, living for and off the gold they did not dig with blood of hand and sweat of brow. Manifestly, Jesse Smith had selected the spot for Kells's permanent location at Alder Creek with an eye for the bandit's peculiar needs. It was out of sight of town, yet within a hundred rods of the nearest huts, and closer than that to a sawmill. It could be approached by a shallow ravine that wound away toward the creek and it was backed up against a rugged bluff in which there was a narrow gorge, choked with pieces of weathered cliff, and no doubt the bandits could go and come in that direction. There was a spring near at hand, and a grove of spruce trees. The ground was rocky, and apparently unfit for the digging of gold. While Batewood began preparations for supper, and Cleve built the fire, and Smith looked after the horses, Kells and Pierce stepped off the ground where the cabin was to be erected. They selected a level bench down upon which a huge cracked rock as large as a house had rolled. The cabin 
was to be backed up against this stone, and in the rear, under cover of it, a secret exit could be made and hidden. The bandit wanted two holes to his burrow. When the group sat down to the meal, the gulch was full of sunset colors, and strangely they were all some shades of gold. Beautiful golden veils, misty, ethereal, shone in rays across the gulch from the broken ramparts, and they seemed so brilliant, so rich, prophetic of the treasures of the hills. But that golden sunset changed. The sun went down red, leaving a sinister shadow over the gulch, growing darker and darker. Joan saw Cleve thoughtfully watching this transformation, and she wondered if he had caught the subtle mood of nature. For whatever had been the hope and brightness, the golden glory of this new El Dorado, this sudden uprising Alder Creek, with its horde of brave and toiling miners, the truth was that Jack Kells and Golden had ridden into the camp and the sun had gone down red. Joan knew that great mining camps were always happy, rich, free, lucky, honest places till the fame of gold brought evil men. And she had not the slightest doubt that the sun of Alder Creek's brief and glad day had set forever. Twilight was stealing down from the hills when Kells announced to his party, Bate, you and Jesse keep camp. Pierce, you look out for any of the gang. But meet in the dark. Cleve, you can go with me. Then he turned to Joan. Do you want to go with us to see the sights, or would you rather stay here? I'd like to go, if only I didn't look so, so dreadful in this suit, she replied. Kells laughed and the campfire glare lighted the smiling faces of Pierce and Smith. Why, you'll not be seen, and you look far from dreadful. Can't you give me a longer coat? faltered Joan. Cleve heard, and without speaking, he went to his saddle, and unrolled his pack. Inside a slicker he had a gray coat. Joan had seen it many a time, and it brought a pang of memories of Holdley. Had that been years ago? Cleve handed this coat to Joan. Thank you, she said. Kells held the coat for her and she slipped into it. She seemed lost. It was long, coming way below her hips. And for the first time in days, she felt she was Joan Randall again. Modesty is all very well in a woman, but it's not always becoming, remarked Kells. Turn up your collar. Pull down your hat farther. There. If you won't go as a youngster now, I'll eat Dandy Dale's outfit and get you silk dresses, huh? huh Joan was not deceived by his humor. He might like to look at her in that outrageous bandit costume. It might have pleased certain vain and notoriety-seeking proclivities of his, habits of his California road agent days. But she felt that notwithstanding this, once she had donned the long coat, he was relieved and glad in spite of himself. Joan had a little rush of feeling. Sometimes she almost liked this bandit. Once he must have been something very different. They set out, Joan between Kells and Cleve. How strange for her. She had daring enough to feel for Jim's hand in the dark and to give it a squeeze. Then he nearly broke her fingers. She felt the fire in him. It was indeed a hard situation for him. The walking was rough, owing to the uneven road and the stones. Several times Joan stumbled and her spurs jangled. They passed ruddy campfires where steam and smoke arose with savory odors, where red-faced men were eating, and they passed other campfires. Burned out and smoldering, some tents had dim lights, throwing shadows on the canvas, and others were dark. There were men on the road, all headed for town, gay, noisy, and profane. Then Joan saw uneven rows of lights, some dim and some bright, and crossing before them were moving dark figures. Again Kells bethought himself of his own disguise, and buried his chin in his scarf, and pulled his wide-brimmed hat down, so that hardly a glimpse of his face could be seen. Joan 
could not have recognized him at the distance of a yard. They walked down the middle of the road, past the noisy saloons, past the big, flat structure with its sign, Last Nugget, and its open windows where shafts of light shone forth, and all the way down to the end of town. Then Kells turned back. He scrutinized each group of men he met. He was looking for members of his border legion. Several times he left Cleve and Jones standing in the road while he peered into the saloons. At these brief intervals, Joan looked at Cleve with all her heart in her eyes. He never spoke. He seemed under a strain. Upon the return, when they reached the last nugget, Kells said, Jim, hang on to her like grim death. She's worth more than all the gold in Alder Creek. Then they started for the door. Joan clung to Cleve on one side and on the other, instinctively, with a frightened girl's actions, she let go of Kell's arms and slipped her hand in his. He seemed startled. He bent to her ear, for the din made ordinary talk indistinguishable. The involuntary hand in his evidently had pleased and touched him, even hurt him, for his whisper was husky. It's all right. You're perfectly safe. First Joan made out a glare of smoky lamps, a huge place full of smoke and men and sounds. Kells led the way slowly. He had his own reason for observance. There was a stench that sickened Joan, a blended odor of tobacco and rum and wet sawdust and smoking oil. There was a noise that appeared almost deafening the loud talk and vacant laughter of drinking men, and a din of creaky fiddles and scraping boots and boisterous mirth. This last and dominating sound came from an adjoining room, which Joan could see through a wide opening. There was dancing, but Joan could not see the dancers because of the intervening crowd. Then her gaze came back to the features nearer at hand. Men and youths were lined up to a long bar nearly as high as her head. Then there were excited shouting groups round gambling games. There were men in clusters sitting on upturned kegs, round a box for a table, and dirty bags of gold dust were in evidence. The gamblers at the cards were silent, and in strange contrast with the others, and in each group was at least one dark-garbed hard-eyed gambler who was not a minor. Joan saw boys not yet of age, flushed and haggard, wild with the frenzy of winning and cast down in defeat. There were jovial, grizzled old prospectors to whom the scene and company were pleasant reminders of bygone days. There were desperados whose glittering eyes showed that they had no gold with which to gamble. Joan suddenly felt Kells's start, and she believed she heard a low, hissing exclamation, and she looked for the cause. Then she saw familiar dark faces. They belonged to men of Kells's legion, and with his broad back to her, there sat the giant Golden. Already he and his allies had gotten together in defiance or indifference to Kells's orders. Some of them were already under the influence of drink. But though they saw Kells, they gave no sign of recognition. Golden did not see Joan. And for that she was thankful. And whether or not his presence caused it, the fact was that she suddenly felt as much of a captive as she had in Cabin Gulch, and feared that her escape would be harder because in a community like this Kells would watch her closely. Kells led Joan and Cleve from one part of the smoky hall to another, and they looked on at the games and the strange raw life manifested there. The place was getting packed with men. Kells's party encountered Blicky and Beady Jones together. They passed by as strangers. Then Joan saw Beard and Chick Williams, arm in arm, strolling about like roistering miners. Williams telegraphed the keen, fleeting glance at Kells, then went on, to be lost in the crowd. Handy Oliver brushed by Kells, jostling him, apparently by accident, and he said, 
Excuse me, mister. There were other familiar faces. Kells's gang were all in Alder Creek and the dark machinations of the bandit leader had been put into operation. What struck Joan forcibly was that, though there was hilarity and comradeship, they were not manifested in any general way. These miners were strangers to one another. The groups were strangers, the gamblers were strangers, the newcomers were strangers, and over all hung an atmosphere of distrust. Good fellowship abided only in the many small companies of men who stuck together. The mining camps that Joan had visited had been composed of an assortment of prospectors and hunters who made one big jolly family. This was a gold strike, and the difference was obvious. The hunting for gold was one thing, in its relation to the searchers. After it had been found in a rich field, the conditions of life and character changed. Gold had always seemed wonderful and beautiful to Joan. She absorbed here something that was the nucleus of hate. Why could not these miners, young and old, stay in their camps and keep their gold? That was the fatality. The pursuit was a dream, a glittering allurement. The possession incited a lust for more. And that was madness. Joan felt that in these reckless, honest miners, there was a liberation of the same wild element which was driving the passion of Kells's border legion. Gold, then, was a terrible thing. "'Take me in there,' said Joan, conscious of her own excitement, and she indicated the dance hall. Kells laughed as if at her audacity, but he appeared reluctant. "'Please take me, unless—' Joan did not know what to add but she meant unless it was not right for her to see any more. A strange curiosity had stirred in her. After all, this place where she now stood was not greatly different from the picture imagination had conjured up. The dance hall, however, was beyond any creation of Jones's mind. "'Let me have a look first, said Kells, and he left Joan with Cleve. When he had gone, Joan spoke without looking at Cleve, though she held fast to his arm. "'Jim, it could be dreadful here, all in a minute,' she whispered. "'You've struck it exactly,' he replied. All Alder Creek needed to make it hell was Kells and his gang. "'Thank heaven I turned you back in time, Jim. You'd have, have gone the pace here.' He nodded grimly. Then Kells returned and led them back through the room to another door, where spectators were fewer. Joan saw perhaps a dozen couples of rough, whirling, jigging dancers in a half-circle of watching men. The hall was a wide platform of boards with posts holding a canvas roof. The sides were open. The lights were situated at each end, huge, round, circus tent lamps. There were rude benches and tables, where reeling men surrounded a woman. Joan saw a young miner in dusty boots and corduroys lying drunk or dead in the sawdust. Her eyes were drawn back to the dancers, and to the dance that bore some semblance to a waltz. In the din, the music could scarcely be heard. As far as the men were concerned, this dance was a bold and violent expression of excitement on the part of some and for the rest a drunken, mad fling. Sight of the women gave Joan's curiosity a blunt check. She felt queer. She had not seen women like these, and their dancing, their actions, their looks, were beyond her understanding. Nevertheless, they shocked her, disgusted her, sickened her, and suddenly when it dawned upon her, an unbelievable, vivid suggestion, that they were the wildest, most terrible element, this dark stream of humanity lured by gold, then she was appalled. "'Take me out of here,' she besought Kells, and he led her out instantly. They went through the gambling hall and into the crowded street back toward the camp. "'You saw enough,' said Kells, "'but nothing to what will break out by and by. This camp is new, it's rich. Gold is the cheapest thing.' 
It passes from hand to hand. Ten dollars an ounce. Buyers don't look at the scales. Only the gamblers are crooked. But all this will change. Kells did not say what that change might be. But the click of his teeth was expressive. Joan did not, however, gather from it, and the dark meaning of his tone, that the Border Legion would cause this change. That was in the nature of events. A great strike of gold might enrich the world, but it was a catastrophe. Long into the night Joan lay awake, and at times stirring, the silence. There was waft to her, on a breeze, the low, strange murmur of the gold camp's strife. Joan slept late next morning, and was awakened by the unloading of lumber. Teams were drawing planks from the sawmill. Already a skeleton framework for Kells's cabin had been erected. Jim Cleve was working with the others, and they were sacrificing thoroughness to haste. Joan had to cook her own breakfast, which task was welcome, and after it had been finished, she wished for something more to occupy her mind but nothing offered. Finding a comfortable seat among some rocks, where she would be inconspicuous, she looked on at the building of Kells's cabin. It seemed strange and somehow comforting to watch Jim Cleve work. He had never been a great worker. Would this experience on the border make a man of him? She felt assured of that. If ever a cabin sprang up like a mushroom, that bandit rendezvous was the one. Kells worked himself and appeared no mean hand. By noon the roof of Clappard's was on, and the siding of the same material had been started. Evidently there was not to be a fireplace inside. Then a teamster drove up with a wagon load of purchases Kells had ordered. Kells helped unload this and evidently was in search of articles. Presently he found them, and then approached Joan to deposit before her an assortment of bundles, little and big. "'There, Miss Modesty,' he said. "'Make yourself some clothes. You can shake Dandy Dale's outfit, except when we're on the trail. And say, if you knew what I had to pay for this stuff, you'd think there was a bigger robber in Alder Creek than Jack Kells. And, come to think of it, my name's now Blight. You're my daughter. If anyone asks. Joan was so grateful to him for the goods and the permission to get out of Dandy Dale's suit as soon as possible that she could only smile her thanks. Kells stared at her, then turned abruptly away. Those little unconscious acts of hers seemed to affect him strangely. Joan remembered that he had intended to parade her in Dandy Dale's costume to gratify some vain, abnormal side of his bandit's proclivities. He had weakened. Here was another subtle indication of the deterioration of the evil of him. How far would it go? Joan thought dreamily, and with a swelling heart, of her influence upon this hardened bandit, upon that wild boy, Jim Cleve. All that afternoon and part of the evening in the campfire light, and all of the next day, Joan sewed, so busy that she scarcely lifted her eyes from her work. The following day she finished her dress, and with no little pride, for she had both taste and skill. Of the men, Bate Wood had been most interested in her task, and he would let things burn on the fire to watch her. That day the rude cabin was completed. It contained one long room, and at the back a small compartment partitioned off from the rest, and built against and around a shallow cavern in the huge rock. This compartment was for Joan. There were a rude board door with padlock and key, a bench upon which the blankets had been flung, a small square hole cut in the wall to serve as a window. What with her own few belongings and the articles of furniture that Kells bought for her, Joan soon had a comfortable room, even a luxury compared to what she had been used to for weeks. Certainly it was that Kells meant to keep her a prisoner, or virtually so. 
Joan had no sooner spied the little window than she thought it would be possible for Jim Cleve to talk to her there from the outside. Kells verified Jones's suspicion by telling her that she was not to leave the cabin of her own accord, as she had been permitted to do back in Cabin Gulch, and Joan retorted that there she had made him a promise not to run away, which promise she now took back. The promise had worried her. She was glad to be honest with Kells. He gazed at her somberly. "'You'll be worse off if you do, and I'll be better off,' he said. And then, as an afterthought, he added, "'Golden might not think you a white elephant on his hands. Remember his way, the cave and the rope.' So instinctively or cruelly he chose the right name to bring shuddering terror into Joan's soul. End of chapter 13